Hi everyone, this is Bert from Season Gaming, and thanks for tuning in to this week's BitCast. We're at episode 22, and I'm joined as usual by Ains. We have a few fun stories for you today, including the new Tomb Raider game. We have some Super Smash Brothers news, and Geralt coming to Sil Calibur. So Ains, why don't you kick us off with some fun news today? Yeah, hello everyone. So Geralt, uh, one of my favorite characters in gaming. I've talked a lot about him. Did the uh, statue review, which uh, many of you have watched. And uh, yeah, he's joining Soul Calibur. So this was... Uh, this was certainly unexpected. I know CD Projekt Red was teasing that this was they had some Witcher related news a couple weeks ago or last week it was, I believe. And um, this is not what uh, what we had in mind, I don't think. Obviously, a lot of people were hoping to hear that, you know, they've kind of enlarged their studio and thus they were going to be working on another Witcher game. But no, not yet. Rather, we're getting Geralt in Soul Calibur 6, which is still pretty neat. Um, Sadly, as much as I love Geralt, I don't think it'll be enough to uh, get me to buy Soul Calibur 6 for it. I'm just not into those types of games anymore. But for fans of the game, um, especially fans of Witcher as well, this is really neat. And his implementation looks pretty cool, too, the way he uses uh, both swords and his signs abilities as well. Yeah, to your point, I was going to say that it actually looks pretty cool from a Witcher standpoint. It looks like he's hitting on everything from his moves, his look. I was kind of worried that they would change his look to kind of fit into the Soul Calibur universe, but it seems like they left it the same. Um, but it is kind of cool from a fighting standpoint to see kind of that guest character come through. If you remember, I can't remember which Soul Calibur it was, but we had Link and we had Yoda um, coming in some of the other ones. So it's, it's kind of cool for them to do it. I'm kind of with you. I'm a little bit over the fighter. Uh, genre in general every once in a while something will catch my eye like Injustice or Mortal Kombat or something but unless Soul Calibur is mind blowing I'm not going to be jumping on it so kind of cool to see I mean if you're watching us on video right now you can see the trailer and you can kind of see what we're talking about so it looks pretty good but I think both of us are going to be passing on it um, let's talk about another game that's kind of one of our most anticipated uh, releases of the year if not obviously the spring coming up but um, God of War has gone gold so I know both of us have that collector's edition, um, what is it, the Mason collector's edition, Ains? Yeah, the Stone Mason edition, yep. Yeah, we both got reserved. We're really looking forward to it. There's been some kind of fun news that where they had a uh, some gameplay leaked that looked pretty spectacular. Um, they are showing that this game is going to be a bit more cinematic than some of the other ones, which is kind of, uh, it's got to be super cinematic because the other ones were pretty cinematic. And funny enough, the other day when I was waiting for a game to load, um, I played God of War 3 Remastered on my PS4. So maybe I'll finish it up before the game comes out, but um, I'm not sure. It's looking pretty good so far. Yeah, it's definitely um, definitely different. And uh, I know some people, um, some of the bigger people in the industry got to uh, play it last week and some of the impressions I've been reading about. But it's, a couple of things that really jumped out is that it's... Um, it's filmed in a single shot, a single camera shot, and it has no loading screen. So all the loading screens are kind of hidden behind the cinematics. And uh, really high, highlights the relationship between, um, you know, uh, Kratos and his son there. So it's it's got that kind of look and feel of something a little more uh, deep and sincere, uh, you know, kind of in the vein of Last of Us or something, which is really interesting for the God of War franchise. And a lot of people are saying, you know, it takes a really different turn than the old God of War games, which are pretty much just pure action games, you know. Um, fortunately, of course, we did see that the game is still uh, has a lot of action and some brutality, which is kind of to be expected in a mature game like God of War. But I think what interests me most, honestly, is the fact that uh, a lot of people are saying this is more like an ARPG now. So you actually customize Kratos and level him up and level skills, and there's items and uh, weapon customization with runes and other things. So I, I found that really interesting because I prefer games... Uh, like that to have some depth around the customization of the character. So now I'm, uh, you know, I was pretty excited for it before. It wasn't my most anticipated game of the year, um, but now I'm I'm really looking forward to it. So we're uh, what three weeks away. It'll be here. Yeah, right around the corner. And um, I did hear some stuff uh, from the people that did get their hands on it recently, saying that it does appear to be kind of a bigger game than expected. So if you were expecting kind of a short title, I think some of the other Gods of Wars were only, you know, anywhere between 10 and, 10 and 15 hours to finish the campaign. This one is showing to be plus 20 hours, if not more than that. So that's kind of cool. Um, a lot of us were kind of worried that it might be really short and just something else. And the last thing was is that it looks awesome on the PS4 Pro. So if you have that PS4 Pro, You'll be able to take advantage of one of the better looking games out this this generation. So um, looking really cool. So I, I think both of us can't wait to get our hands on that. And oh, one more thing I, I do remember you mentioning about The Last of Us. So Santa Monica Studio did say that they learned a lot from Last of Us. So I think that that relationship between him and his son is going to be very similar. And um, the storytelling may be similar as well. Yeah, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. 
Yeah, so the next big news, which was kind of a, a leak slash intentional leak, I'm not sure how you want to look at this, but um, with the new Tomb Raider movie that just came out and all the news about Tomb Raider that was coming, we did get the teaser trailer um, a bit earlier than expected. And so the, the new game is officially going to be called Shadow of the Tomb Raider, um, and we are expecting it in September. Um, I believe September, let me look at my notes here, September 14th to be exact. And the teaser trailer obviously had a lot of cuts all over the place. We didn't really get to see a lot of uh, the story or what we're going to see with the um, – exact details of the villain obviously is going to be lara in there and doing a lot of uh, fun stuff as she usually does but it does look pretty cool i'm assuming we'll be seeing more of a full trailer that's going to be coming out in the near future and we'll probably be able to get our hands on it at, at e3 if we don't see more of it than that yeah i'm i'm really excited about this one funny enough so bert and i were just talking i actually just got home from seeing tomb raider the movie um and it's uh you know it's got a lot of mixed opinions i've seen some lower reviews i've seen some better reviews and all kinds of uh you know differences between what people think of it i i, I liked it i think it could have been better in a few ways but otherwise it was a pretty good movie um in terms of the game I, i'm really really excited for it um you know we saw what uh Crystal Dynamics did with um, Rise of the Tomb Raider, especially on the newer hardware like Xbox One X. So I can only imagine, you know, Shadow of the Tomb Raider is going to be uh, kind of mind blowing there. And it's coming at a good time in early September because, uh, you know, once we get into October with um, new Call of Duty and um, uh, Red Dead Redemption 2, which is going to take over. So I've got six weeks to play that before Red Dead Redemption 2 comes out because then everything else gets pushed aside. Um, the only thing to keep in mind here is that the developer of this is not Crystal Dynamics. They're working on the Avengers game. Um, so this is Eidos Montreal, um, which most recently did the Thief reboot. So they're taking over here for the uh, the what they're calling the conclusion of Lara's origin story. So I don't really know what that means yet. But, um, you know, we'll see if they can keep up to the excellence and the high standard that Crystal Dynamics had done with the prior two games. Yeah, and Crystal Dynamics has supported that game through the PS4, uh, the enhancements from both consoles, and then the 20th Anniversary Edition, which is a must-play if you haven't played that. By the way, if you on either console, whichever you're on, if you only played the base game for Rise of the Tomb Raider, make sure you grab the Season Pass, which I think is running for like five bucks right now. You get a ton of content uh, to go through and play and spend, and actually you can go back and play the content, play differently. And uh, there's tons of content, and it kind of expands on the story. So the DLC was pretty good. Um, I'm not going to say it's the best DLC I've ever played, but for five, ten bucks, it's it's hard to pass up on it. So check that out before the new one comes out. You've got plenty of time. Uh, some more news um, on the Microsoft front. So State of Decay 2 uh, will be microtransaction free. Um, as we kind of know in the industry right now, microtransactions almost a bad word, and it kind of uh, messes uh, studios up with you know the press in general. Um, with this game coming out in the near future, it was recently announced that it is going to be microtransaction free. So I did see that there is going to be some visual um, uh, upgrades that you can do in the game with kind of the in-game currency. Uh, Ains, anything else you want to add on that one? It's kind of a, a bigger note as to how the game play out. Yeah, no, not really. I think it's pretty interesting that this game has uh, been in development for a few years now. It seems to have a lot of content. Um, you know, people put 100 plus hours into the first one when this is at least three times bigger with a lot more depth around the character building. And yet it's going to be twenty nine ninety nine. Obviously, it's going to be on Game Pass. And then they also confirmed there's no microtransaction. So uh, kind of interesting. I, I don't know if uh, they're just trying to build the fan base for this game by getting people in at a lower price. But uh, I'm definitely interested. And in I think this will be one. It really wasn't on my radar too heavily, but I think uh, there's there's a lot of good reasons to play it. So maybe get a group together and check it out. Yeah, and if you were on the fence as well, um, IGN actually had uh, some. I think they were at the studios and they went in and played it multiplayer wise. I was I was not interested in it at all, and until I saw the gameplay, um, it looks really good. It looks really polished. Uh, they've had a lot of time working on it, so thankfully we've got Game Pass and I can check it out. So um, looks pretty fun. Um, some other news that has come out recently is uh, the Super Smash Brothers. So we did talk about Nintendo Direct uh, last time we had our big cast, and it was kind of up in the air. We weren't sure as to if we were going to get a remaster, a port of the one that released on the Wii U. Uh, some new news has come out that it is going to be a completely new game. It's not going to be a remaster. So there's some good news coming from there, which has been one of our biggest worries, if not rants, um, in some of my recent comments on Bitcast. But happy to see that that's happening. Um, and some fun news regarding this announcement, there are some uh, on, on Twitter, uh, there were some uh, Twitter users that were hitting up Phil Spencer to see if he would allow any of the uh, Microsoft exclusive characters to be allowed to be played with in Super Smash. In the past, we've seen um, something like Snake show up in the game. We've seen Bayonetta, which I guess is a Nintendo uh, franchise, but you know, not your typical Nintendo characters. And his only reply was, yep. 
So um, I think the character that was teased or at least asked if it would uh, be allowed to be in the game was Banjo Kazooie. I know, you're, I know you're not a Banjo Kazooie fan, Ames, but um, <laughs> would that be a reason you would buy Smash if, if Banjo Kazooie showed up? If it has online play. So that's probably if I could fit a question mark over the entire screen of our BitCast here for Nintendo. Um, only because I've got no one to really play Smash with here. The kids really are kind of grown out of that. Uh, they're at that age where they're just playing shooters nowadays. So um, I would play Smash, especially if Banjo was in it. Um, I think it would be absolutely hilarious if Microsoft allowed some other characters in it. But I know that uh, Banjo was the, the core one. So I, I'll honestly play anything with Banjo-Kazooie in it. I just love them that much. Yeah, like uh, maybe Chief, even though that wouldn't be much of a... I don't even know what Chief would look like in a Smash game, to be honest. It'd be kind of weird. Well, Chief, um, uh, they're putting him in the bomber, man, so <laughs> it can't be any worse than yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> as, as me and you joked about that, I don't even know why that game's coming to the Xbox One. It was pretty <laughs> poor. Um, but hey, yeah, it's it's coming, so uh, good for that. Um, some other news, Nintendo announced that the uh, Splatoon 2 Championship, and there's also going to be some Smash Brothers Invitation, will be at E3. So... Um, you know, some of those gamers are pretty hardcore. I mean, I think they're still playing the GameCube version at some of the tournaments. I think they play the Wii version. And um, funny enough, I think I've seen even the N64 version of Smash being played at a retro uh, con that I went to. So talk about legs for those games. Um, tons of fans. Yeah, people just love them. I was at um, I was at a, uh, a Draftcade a couple weeks ago, you know, a barcade. And um, they have a TV there set up with an, uh, con various consoles at different times among all the arcade machines. And sure enough, they had an N64 Smash. And all the uh, my son and all his friends from his hockey team were uh, playing that quite a bit. They were just sitting there playing Smash Brothers on the N64. It's kind of funny to go back and look at nowadays, but uh, they were having a blast. Yeah, yeah, and uh, funny enough, to your point earlier, if, if I don't have anybody to play with it locally, I may not grab it, because the only times that I've played Smash on the Wii U and the Wii is when I have friends over. I don't think I've ever sat there and played Smash by myself. I don't consider myself a pro player or anything to practice or anything, and there's not really a story, so maybe I won't pick it up. Maybe I will. We'll see what happens. I'm, I'm sure it'll be great when it comes out. Yeah, I think, um, uh, sorry, I was just going to say my, my dream there would be, you know, if they especially if they do Banjo-Kazooie or I don't think they're going to do Chief, let's be honest. But, you know, something like that, I would love if we could play like two on two online, you know what I mean? Like me and you team up against two other people. That's what Nintendo really needs to get going. Maybe a Battle Royale <laughs> mode in Smash or something with all the other games coming. Yeah, no. um, <laughs> a giant. yeah that would be interesting. A giant stage with like 50 players on Smash, whatever, that'd be Actually, it wouldn't surprise me if that be happened. It would be a cluster F. Yeah. I'll <laughs> let you take the next news item because I know you're probably excited about this next title. <laughs> Yeah, so CD Projekt Red, uh, you know, I, I keep talking about my love for Witcher 3. Um, they are ramping up staffing. They've actually opened a third studio uh, to help bolster the development of Cyberpunk 2077, which the rumor is right now we're going to see at E3 this year. Um, you know, this is far and away, if you just over look over the entire industry, far and away my uh, most anticipated title, I think, for many, honestly. They came out this week with some quotes around it saying it's hugely ambitious. What they're going for graphically is uh, you kind of next level. And uh, there will be character classes, character creation, and, uh, you know, a huge amount of depth to the game. So different from The Witcher, where you're playing, a, you know, a game based on the books, which is a defined character and characters around him. Um, this is going to be, you know, kind of write your own story. So the, you know, we talked before about what the best sci-fi role-playing game series was. And I think you and I both kind of threw Mass Effect uh, hat into the ring there. Um, we won't talk about Andromeda again. But, um, yeah, I think this is going to be amazing. I hope we do see it at E3, of course. Um, and then just really quick to touch on this, too. A rumor came out just this week. Um that CD Projekt Red was saying they are going to be working on another AAA RPG for 2020 or 2021 release. So, of course, uh, all the Witcher uh, lovers like myself kind of are already thinking, is this a, a Witcher 4? Um, maybe not a continuation of Geralt's story, but maybe a uh, you know Witcher prequel where you play as, um, as another character or something like that, one of the other Witchers. So we'll see. But uh, exciting news for CD Projekt Red. They're just killing it. And uh, I bet you Cyberpunk 2077 is going to be an industry-changing title when it releases. Yeah, so big question. I mean, do you think this game's actually going to release this generation or maybe a launch title for the next generation? Yeah, we talked about that before, and I don't know. I, I don't see how a game... I mean, Witcher 3 ran on, a, on an Xbox One and a PlayStation 4. 
Um, I loved it. You know, I put over 200 hours into it on that platform. But if you just go back and play it, especially if you've gotten used to a newer PC or the X or something, um, it does look pretty dated. So if they're going for something that stretches it, you know, a lot further, and this is going to be four, five, six years later than when Witcher 3 released. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's going to be uh, it's going to be a challenge, I think, to make it work on the base Xbox One or PlayStation 4. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I mean, maybe they'll do like a Zelda or Mario Odyssey like they did for the Switch and moving it from the Wii U. But uh, even then, I don't know if the computing power, I think they were saying that the Xbox One X and the PS4 Pro would struggle to run it at full spec um, and just rumor rumor talk. But uh, yeah, to your point, if they're doing something just amazing and, and revolutionary, then um, see what happens. Um, other news, we we're talking about microtransactions a second ago. So the game that got roasted probably the most this fall, uh, specific to microtransactions, Star Wars Battlefront 2. Um, so they've recently rolled out their most recent uh, progression and leveling system uh, for the multiplayer. Um, and I don't know how many people are still playing the game multiplayer-wise, but if you left, right now might be a time to come back. So um, a lot of the microtransaction talk is gone, and pretty much the developer has given the fans everything that they've asked for for the most part. So microtransactions are back, but they're only cosmetic now. So the uh, pay to win uh, mentality is completely gone. Not sure how much of it was ever actually there, but um, most of it has been heard from the developer and they've kind of fixed it. So are you coming back to this game? I'm not sure if I am, unless there's a push for a big group of us to go back. Yeah, it's kind of funny, actually. Um, just late last night, I was telling my buddy who I was playing Battlefront 2 with previously, uh, I told him we need to go back to it and start playing it again. Um, like I said before, uh, I had a lot of fun with it. I, I understand all the complaints. Some of them were valid. Obviously, it was overblown, as everything tends to be now. Um, but it is a fantastic game. There's a there's a lot to it. There's a lot to play. Um, they keep adding content to it, and this new progression system sounds pretty interesting. So if you're not aware, um, you know, early on, you had to kind of earn credits and unlock all the heroes and the hero ships and everything, depending on the mode you're playing. All of that, the entire game, all the content in the game is now open for everyone. Um, and you kind of level up each hero, and that's how the progression is. Completely different system. So, and all the star cards and abilities and everything you earn simply by playing um, and leveling up. It's nothing in the crates now except for cosmetics. So, um, it's what you know. It, the game probably should have been at launch. It's sad that it took five months to get there, but it is a good game. You know, the the solo movie comes out what in two months in May. So I have to imagine they have DLC planned for that to go into the game as well. So it, it could be a lot of fun just to jump in and play throughout the year. Yeah, funny enough, the Solo movie kind of fell off my radar with all the Marvel talk and all the movies that are coming out. I completely forgot Solo was coming out. So I don't know if that's a, a marketing blunder for them. But um, I don't know. It seems like with Disney owning both Marvel and the Star Wars franchise now, they've got to kind of compete with each other, which is kind of interesting. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I might give it a try if we go back to it. Um, I don't think I had too much of a problem with the leveling system. I just didn't get too much into the game in general. But I don't know. We'll figure it out. Um, some fun news, or maybe not fun news, depending on how you look at this. this is uh, So on the Xbox Microsoft Store, I think this is specifically in a, a separate country, because based on the screenshots, it didn't appear to be American um, as far as the way the store looks. Um, but there was kind of a rental system that kind of leaked out by accident, it's now gone. But what it's looking like is Microsoft may be testing the waters on having game rentals on the Microsoft Store. So you would rent a game, play it, and then once your rental's up, you would uh, kind of lose your license to that game. You won't be able to play it anymore, kind of like their free to try games that they have free weekends on. So might be a good thing. I'm not quite sure with us having um, Xbox Game Pass. I've, I've kind of loved that uh, idea of playing a game and you know, when you're done with it, uninstall it or whatever the case is. But what are your thoughts here, Ains, on a rental program? Honestly, I think this is kind of a no-brainer. I'm surprised that it's not done already. Um, funny enough, I was listening to a podcast the other day about the, def the decline of Blockbuster, um, which we've talked about in the past. And, you know, growing up, used to go to Blockbuster Video every weekend and run a game for the Genesis or Super Nintendo, and I'd play it all weekend, take it back, and then play another game the following weekend. So, I mean, all this really is is replicating that behavior, but in the digital world, right? I mean, you could imagine uh, kids like my son who may want to try a game that I don't own if there is one out there. Um, but, you know, I, um, you know, I just pick a game. I don't know, Call of Duty. Um but they don't own it, and uh, you know they can. Their parents can spend three or four bucks or something for them to play Call of Duty from a Friday to a Sunday or something like that. I, I think that makes a lot of sense, and because it's digital, um, 
you know, Microsoft could really structure it where you could run it as long as you want, right? You could maybe do like the weekend for four bucks. You could do a week for six and, you know, a month for 15 or something like that. I, I don't really know, but I think the possibilities there are, are pretty high and there's no reason for Microsoft and Sony. Um, we won't talk about Nintendo, but there's no reason for Microsoft or Sony not to do it because the infrastructure is already there. They're already you know, dealing with tens and tens of millions of digital licenses. All you have to do is activate it and then deactivate it. It's really not that difficult from a back-end perspective. Yeah, I guess the only thing that would be weird would be for a single-player game that only lasts eight to ten hours or something. You rent it, pay five, ten bucks for it, and you've already bought the whole game and finished the whole game, and then what do you do as far as the developer goes? So I think it would have to be based on the developer allowing that to happen. I think we've seen similar things like that happen in general. But um, yeah, I think it could be awesome for multiplayer stuff. To your point, like if you were on the fence about the new Call of Duty or Battlefield or Battlefront for the for any case, check it out for ten hours. You know, five bucks, whatever the case is. You like it, great. If not, then you just put it back. Developer wins, Microsoft wins, PlayStation wins, whatever the case is, and it's kind of a win for everybody. So we'll see if it's true. Um, like I said, this was just a screenshot that was taken, which is kind of of uh, turn rumor mill kind of going. I, this is not part of the uh, the pilot program either. The, uh, what do they call it? The, uh, what's the Insider. test program? Yeah. Insider program. In Insider program. So nothing showing up like that. So this may have just leaked on accident. So we'll see what happens. So um, in some sales uh, news that have recently come out, we've been following kind of the, the console sales to see how each one's doing. Um, some interesting news happening back in February is the Switch fell from its uh, reign at the top of the number one sold consoles, and it came out in third. So Sony PlayStation 4 did come in first, Xbox second, and Nintendo Switch. Now, we've kind of been talking about a little bit on our channel and on our site that, you know, is the Switch kind of overblown? Is there a lot of hype based on software found in that first year? Could it be slowing down now that everybody's grabbed their, you know, their Zelda and their Mario and their Mario Kart? You know, what's coming? There's, as we've talked about before, what's new from the first party standpoint? We have a lot of the remasters coming, but you know, what's coming up? What, what are your thoughts, Ains? Yeah, this is interesting, and uh, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I did remember reading that the Switch, it wasn't like a, a small amount either. It was something like 30, 35% less than the, the PS4, and the Xbox and PS4 were really close, so... Um, you know, it, it was a, a definitely distant third, at least in February. So I don't know. Like you said, we've talked about it. Um, <clears throat> you know, they're, Nintendo's obviously hyping Smash Brothers. And so it seems from a first party perspective, that's going to be their go to game this year. Um, but I do find it funny that, you know, they're getting a lot of the ports, as you said, they're getting a lot of those uh, third party kind of indie titles, um, which is all fantastic because those make for perfect games on the go as well. Um, but here we are talking about. Um, you know, fantastic years, and, and we touched on this last week a little bit, but if Smash Brothers is their only first-party IP, major IP, um, coming this year, then, you know, why are they not receiving more criticism like uh, we know, for instance, Microsoft does um, for having so few first-party IPs in a year? I don't know. Um, they have Octopath Traveler, but that's third-party. Mario, Mario Tennis is uh, coming, but that's, you know, obviously relatively minor. Uh, Metroid Prime 4, I think, is a, a long ways off yet. And uh, what is it? Bayonetta 3 as well as third party. So I don't know. We'll also, see. Uh, also way off too, so we don't know anything about that launch date. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, I don't know. I It is what it is. Like we said, we're going to kind of watch the Switch pretty closely through 2018 to see if this uh, was kind of an early fad or if it really continues to really to take off through the year. So we'll see. Yeah, uh, it, it'll be kind of weird to see if it follows kind of the way the Nintendo Wii was. Um, when the Nintendo Wii first came out, everybody was grabbing one. I mean, you had grandmas and your parents were buying one to try things out. And then it was on for on fire for a while. But towards the end of the Wii, no one was buying the Wii because uh, just the software wasn't there. So I don't know. The Wii still sold really, really well. It just didn't sell software really, really well um, from, from that standpoint. So I don't know what will happen. We'll see. Um, we may see kind of a curve where it goes up and down every time a new first party game comes out, which wouldn't surprise me every time. I mean, the biggest release from Nintendo this spring is Kirby, and that's kind of average so far. Um, and I don't know. I mean, Yoshi's supposed to be due out 2018. So I don't know. I can just move on from this one, I think. <laughs> spending, spending too much time on it. Um, another uh, kind of big news update is uh, if you did buy Infinite Warfare most recently on Call of Duty and you bought the, uh, I think it was the Prestige Edition, you did get Modern Warfare 1 kind of bundled into it. They said that they would never release it by itself and you had to buy it at the start and all this kind of talk happened. 
and then they ended up releasing it on the side. So um, the Call of Duty franchise is kind of interesting when it comes to that. The big news from this is Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 is uh, rumored to be coming out, and it will be standalone this time, um, and it will also not include online uh, play. And you can kind of take that in a kind of cynical view in the sense to where online play is coming, but you're going to have to pay additional for it. Um, or it can kind of be a good thing and you're just going to play the campaign and uh, stick with the campaign, play it again in the remastered fashion as you did with Modern Warfare 1, um, which did have multiplayer. So um, I don't know. I think the price point that's been rumored is $25 to $30. Um, for just that single player experience. Funny enough, I had a great time with the Modern Warfare 2 in the co-op aspect. So if that's there, if it uh, goes on sale, maybe I'll pick it up. But um, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, I, I honestly was falling asleep thinking about this. <laughs> <laughs> I see you said a heavy eyes over there. With the, yeah. with the amount of games that we have coming, um, especially with substantial single player content, we were just talking about God of War. We've got Far Cry 5 coming in. By the time we release this, it'll be out. Um, you know, it's just, just there's so many new experiences and big experience that to go back and spend 25 bucks to replay a campaign from 10 years ago um, without the obviously the biggest portion of that game, which is the multiplayer. Um, it just doesn't interest me at all. And, and most of the feedback, I would say, I know it's anecdotal, but most of the feedback I saw across social media from Twitter to Reddit to everywhere was they have to be effing joking, right? Like if you're going to bring this back and it doesn't have multiplayer, what's the point? Hey, but if it releases on the Switch, it'll be the best thing ever. <laughs> you know? I bet you it would sell millions. Honestly, yeah, there'll be people. Oh my gosh, I can finally play Call of Duty. Um, that was out like a long time ago. You had plenty of time to play that. Um, but hey, I, I, I put money on it. I bet you it's gonna come come to the Switch, and it'll sell like crazy on the Switch. Oh gosh. Yeah. All right, so that, uh, that's the end of our news for this week, guys. If you saw any other things on the news, um, kind of let us know in the comments or anything. Uh, we try to get the biggest news, not every single piece of news that we'd be talking here for hours. But um, let's move over to our rumors that have happened this week. So maybe if you didn't catch in the news and our rumors, we could probably cover some of the stuff that you probably heard. So most recently, we heard that the most, um, I guess, the development of the next Assassin's Creed game is going to be in China. I don't know if you guys remember hearing that news from, from us, as that was a big rumor based on the name called Empire that it was codenamed as. Well, we have another uh, rumor, and this one's appearing to be a little bit more credible. It is coming from an industry insider that has been right on almost everything when it comes to Assassin's Creed. But the rumor is, is that the next Assassin's Creed will actually be in Greece. So as we kind of see, saw what they did in Egypt with some of the gods and everything, it'll be very interesting if we are messing around with some of the Greek gods this time based on the time period. We don't know, um, but it is going to be kind of cool if it's remodeled and goes into the detail that it was in Origins. As you guys know, um, if you've been following us, I loved Origins, and I'm really into the Greek mythology side of things and kind of Greece and all that stuff in general when it comes to the gods and stuff. So I'm super excited. I hope it's real. Um, I know, Ains, you are still trucking through Origins every day, right? <laughs> I wish I was, honestly. It's kind of funny because it is a fantastic game. And I was going to echo everything you said in that I hope it is, this is true, that it's going to be in Greece. I hope they dive into the Greek mythology. And for God's sakes, just give it to the same team that did Origins. Because um, they, I think they would kill this. I think it would be fantastic. I, I, yeah, I think it'd be great. Well, not, yeah, not so, much else to say. Yeah, that's one of the interesting things about Ubisoft is we're not sure if it is going to be the same team because the uh, once again part of this rumor is that it went into full production in 2017. So um, maybe Origins was getting close to going gold already, and that team had already maybe moved over to the next Assassin's Creed. But uh, we're not sure. Uh, once again, this is going to be simply slated as a credible rumor, uh, not false or a, an official rumor or official by Ubisoft or anything along those lines. But he has not been wrong before, so we'll leave it at that um, and move on to our next rumor. So uh, next rumor coming from the most recent update for the Nintendo Switch, and I mean by OS update. Um, as you can imagine, every time there is a Nintendo Switch update, hackers get into the code and try to find any clues as to what's coming. We've heard of everything from the Microsoft Store having GameCube software. We've heard of uh, other things that have been right or wrong when it comes to system uh, saves and transferring. So uh, the most latest rumor was a new piece of hardware, the new Tegra um, uh, video card and everything that comes along with the operating system of that 
was leaked to be a stronger uh, one that exists in the Nintendo Switch. As a lot of people were kind of suspecting and maybe hoping, the Nintendo Switch may be getting an upgrade or something along the lines, maybe a Nintendo Switch Elite, as you might use as an example, or an X or a Pro, whatever you want to say. Um, and it was a stronger one, and this stronger Tegra uh, chip does have a better, better motherboard and more RAM. So would be kind of cool to see a nicer switch. Ames, would you buy a switch again to get that nice power? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I I probably would because I freaking buy everything, but um, I don't know. I don't really use the switch that much to be honest. But I will say that you know, having gotten used to the X and and playing things at a higher standard, you can definitely kind of see it when you do go back to the switch. So I mean, if I could. You know, again, if you have better hardware, I'm I'm fine with that. Uh, depends on the price, of course. But I think it'll be interesting to see because the Switch is portable. Um, will Nintendo go to the model that they did with the 3DS? Right? I mean, there's several variations of the 3DS, and every few years they just came out with a new one, and most of the software was compatible. Kind of like we're seeing with the forwards compatibility that uh, Microsoft is promising with the Xbox going forward. So I think this is neat. Um, I, I have nothing against it. I think it would be very soon, of course, with the Switch only having been out a year. But um, if they, you know, 2019, they bring out like a Switch 2.0 or however Nintendo's naming convention, the new Switch. Um, yeah, I'd probably pick it up. Yeah, I mean, the other thing, to your point about the handhelds, I mean, if you remember when the DS came out, it was that fat DS, and it went to a slim DS, then it went to a 3DS, and there's been like three different versions of the 3DS, and now there's the 2DS. So, um, yeah, and if I remember correctly, seeing the math of what the hardware costs to build a Switch, it wasn't that expensive, so I can see them upgrading things. Um, it would be cool if they add 1080p support on a handheld versus just the 720 screen that's not there. And if there's more memory and some of the games can be pushed for, further or enhanced um, or kind of like we do with our other consoles, that would be pretty neat. Um, but I would like to see some nicer looking games because <laughs> some of the games just aren't that pretty on the Switch when you get used to the other consoles that exist today. So if it is true... Uh, we'll see. But once again, this is being slated. This one's more of a rumor, um, not even a credible rumor, just people getting into the system of the 5.0 update from the Nintendo Switch. So we'll see what that means for us. Um, the last rumor um, for this week that I am super excited about is the potential for a new Splinter Cell. Uh, this rumor kind of came from a Canadian, uh, from the Canadian Amazon listing um, for what looks to be a official Ubisoft Splinter Cell title. So what they sometimes do is they set a placeholder um, on Amazon, like a placeholder page, and then when it goes official, they'll update it with everything else. We have not heard anything from Ubisoft whatsoever on this rumor. Um, and that was subsequently taken down from uh, the Canadian Amazon site. So um, the other rumor on here was Ironside was seen at some of the Ubisoft offices. So if Ironside is coming back to play as the main character in Splinter Cell, that would make me super excited because um, I thought he was by far the best Sam Fisher. But um, I didn't really hate the last one as far as his voice goes. I love the last game Blacklist. So super excited if it's real. Um, as as many people may disagree with me, I am more of a Splinter Cell than a Metal Gear fan. But um, we've been missing Splinter Cell for a while now, and I think it's time for it to come back. Yeah, funny enough, I think we're both in the minority there because I prefer Splinter Cell to Metal Gear as well. Um, we won't even get into me thinking Metal Gear is overrated, but that is what it is. Um, you're right, though. I think this is neat. I think... Um, if I had to say right now, I think this is absolutely credible. I think we will see Splinter Cell this year at E3. In fact, I think when we did our E3 predictions last year, I think I said I expect to see Splinter Cell at Ubisoft's uh, conference, and we didn't. So this won't surprise me at all. Um, I think it's about time. It could be a huge reboot, and it could certainly be a huge boon for uh, Ubisoft as well. Um, especially given the market. So think about their games. We talked about this a couple of bitcasts ago, but if you think about their games like Division and Siege and uh, Wildlands, how they're continuing to support those, think about the opportunity for a Splinter Cell campaign that also has an online mode, um, you know, six on six, 12 on 12, whatever it may be, kind of spies versus, uh, you know, enemies or whatever the hell they call them. Um, it could be really neat, especially if they put the development time and support into it like they have with their other online titles could definitely be a massive franchise for them. Yeah, if you remember Pandora Tomorrow, I think it was, or Chaos Theory, I can't remember which one it was, but where you could play co-op with your friend throughout Splinter Cell, that was, it was Chaos amazing. Theory, I think, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was amazing. And then you could go online and play twos versus other twos, and it was some of the most fun I ever had. So, um, yeah, please come back, Splinter Cell. Maybe Ubisoft will surprise everybody and have an amazing E3 like they did last year where they just kept on releasing software, 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 and we saw more and more. 
So um, I hope we see something. I'm assuming it's in far development if, it, if it's going on. But once again, just a rumor, and the rumor was based off an Amazon error. So we really can't put anything else on that aside from that. So it's please. coming. Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> it's official. It's official. <laughs> official. You heard it here first. Um, real quick, though, I think Ubisoft, uh, I, honestly, they may be turning into my favorite publisher. I mean, their their catalog right now and the support for their titles and the quality of the titles, they're just killing it. I mean, Siege is growing. Division is coming back. Uh, For Honor is growing again. Uh, Wildlands is excellent. Origins was excellent. Far Cry 5 looks to be excellent. If they bring back Splinter Cell 2 and then they've got Skull and Bones, remember, as well, they're killing it, man. Yep. The only thing they need to get is they need to figure out is a awesome launch game, not the game a year or six months down the road. <laughs> yeah. So if they can figure that out, they'll be everybody's favorite. Our Origins was probably their first, their first one that didn't have issues at launch, right? Yeah, they had very tiny little glitches here and there to where the game was still pretty spot on. I mean, they, they spent a ton of time in testing in that game, so hopefully they continue to do that. Okay, that's our rumors for this week, guys. We're going to talk about uh, some quick developer news, and this is uh, just what we're hearing from the industry in general. So uh, some unfortunate news for Anthem. If you've been kind of uh, you know really tuned into Anthem and you've been kind of at the edge of your seat waiting for it, they lost another uh, high-profile person from their team, and... We're not really sure quite to think about it. Um, Anthem has been kind of all over the place in the news. We've, when they, Obviously, when it first came out at E3, people were blown away by it. But there's been a lot of developmental issues with Anthem. Um, it's been delayed, as, you, as we know where we are at, the, at this time of the year. I personally wouldn't be subscribed if they get delayed again into 2019 um, because they're just not ready to launch or there's issues or whatever the case is. The more and more I hear these things, I just really don't know what to think about it. I'm not sure if I'm going to avoid it or going to buy it right away. It's just throwing me all over the place. So, <laughs> fortunate news. You, you said I uh, personally wouldn't be subscribed. So, you hey, can no go subscribe. ahead. Yeah, this is an interesting one. I think this is just a case of, you know, there's a lot of turmoil that happens within game development, especially in bigger studios and bigger titles. So I think this is a case of that the hype was so big after last year um, and that there's a lot of um, concern about Bioware with Andromeda and Casey Hudson coming back. And I think this is just one of those developments where um, we're hearing more about it. And so from the outside, without knowing all the story, it sounds really... Uh, troublesome. Um, one of the things that did kind of re- reassure me a little bit is one of these high profile people they lost. Um, I don't know if it was this one because there's been a couple um, was a writer. And basically what they said is, you know, this is not really news because the writing is story complete. Anthem is story complete at this point. So, you know, in game development, there's all these different parallel um, kind of work streams that are happening. If you want to go to corporate speak, Um but the writing, if the writing is complete, then, you know, it's not really a surprise that this guy would be done with the game. Now it's all about, you know, finishing touches, polishing, testing, et cetera, and the writers aren't needed. So I hope that's all it is, because this is one of my most anticipated titles for early 2019. Let's keep in mind the current release date for this game is supposedly fiscal year 2019, which means basically within the next year, because it would be before March 31st of 2019. So um, they have said that we are going to see this game at EA Play. I hope you and I are there in person and we get to play it because then we can uh, see for ourselves what it's like. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, we're all kind of hoping that, you know, it's going to turn into something cool. We joked about it being kind of a destiny killer or destiny done the way it should have been done from the beginning. But um, we'll see. I mean, we really can't. uh, We're not in the offices. We have no idea what's going on. There's just more negative news from the development cycle of this game. Um, Another game that has been all over the place and it's kind of turned into our internal little joke is Final Fantasy VII Remake. Um, So this was announced a long time ago at E3, people blown away, standing ovation, Sony won everything again, as we always joke about. Um, But it looks like they might be redoing what they've already developed. So if you remember the history of this game, they had another studio working on it and Square Enix took the development back in house, which was one that was kind of unfortunate, kind of had you thinking. And then I believe it was the game director most recently that said that what has been developed so far is not up to modern gamer standards. So that's kind of an unfortunate comment to hear from the main person that's working with the game. Um, and then we did hear about the episodic nature of how the game is going to be released as well. So it was, you're not going to get the full game at launch. You may get it in three, four, five episodes. And then we've also heard the shifting potential launch date from Square that it may not be coming until 2019, 2020. So the funny thing here is that this is a remake of an existing game. And they were thinking about changing the way the story is told, thinking about how the gameplay plays. 
And so even more negative news come from Final Fantasy VII. We have no idea when it's coming out. Once again, we don't even have a ballpark. But this is not looking good for Final Fantasy VII Remake, which is Ains' favorite Final Fantasy. Game wasn't even that good when it released. I said it. We can, we can move on. Please don't unsubscribe or please continue <laughs> to listen to this podcast because it's, it's important. Don't at me. Don't at me. <laughs> That's all he's got, folks. So we're going to move over to uh... <laughs> he's a funny guy. He's a funny guy. No, also, um, in all seriousness, I'm not a fan, like Bert said. Final Fantasy VII. I, I, it was the game to me that uh, this is going to sound very dramatic. I'm not intending it to, but it's the game for me that killed Final Fantasy. Um, I adored the 16-bit Final Fantasies growing up. Final Fantasy VII was too much of a departure. I hated the whole steampunk theme. Um, it just wasn't my type of game. So I'm, I'm, I'm not anticipating this at all. Um, you know, maybe we'll see it again in E3 and we can say Sony won E3 again with a game that's apparently never coming out. I don't know. <laughs> All right. There you have it, guys. Well, that's, that's our developer news for today. Uh, hopefully not too much sad news and hopefully you're still listening in. If you are, thank you for continuing this big cast with us. But uh, let's jump over to new releases. So at this time of the year, obviously we're not seeing a lot of new releases. And funny enough, the calendar window this time is a lot of remasters and stuff. But let's go over them really quick. And then we'll kind of let you know what we're playing and our thoughts on things. So one of our kind of bigger anticipated releases of the year, Sea of Thieves. So probably one of the most divisive games that have come out recently um, did not score too well from critics. So it's only scoring at a 65, which is also known as weak on the open critic scale. So we'll talk a little bit more about what we think of these as I go through these. But that's the one of the biggest games. This game came out this past week on the 20th. So if you did pick it up, uh, hopefully, you know, let us know what you think about it in the comments. We'll let you know what we think about it shortly. Uh, a Way Out, which is the big co-op game um, that has been kind of uh, on people's calendar for a long time. And as we saw the most recent game awards, the developer was super funny at those. I'm not sure if he was sober, but this game is being reviewed once again, kind of up and down. And just reading a couple different uh, magazines and stuff that we are. Did I say magazines? People still do magazines? <laughs> a couple sites recently. One person loved it from one uh, site. And another person hated everything about this game. So it is scoring at a 79 strong, which is actually pretty high if you think about it um, from that scale. So that's another one. Attack on Titan 2. So if you do watch the anime at all, um, this one is actually being reviewed really well. It's at a 75 um, coming in strong. This one came out on the 20th also. Love that show. I love that show. Jesus. Trolling with the anime all the time. <laughs> Trolling away. Um, Assassin's Creed Rogue. So this one did come out at the very end of last generation, and a lot of people never played it because Black Flag released really quick right after it, and people were just waiting to play the next generation. But this game has been remastered. Um, kind of tells a different story from the Templar side. Um, but this one actually is being reviewed pretty well um, from the fact of it being a remaster and it being kind of a, a whatever release towards the end of the generation at a 72, which is fair. Um, not bad, not good, but if you didn't play it, give it a try. It sh should be something that'll interest you from a story standpoint. Uh, Burnout Paradise, which if you have learned the uh, love the uh, Burnout Paradise in the past, this one was also a remaster, actually scoring really well with an 80 strong. If you have EA access on Xbox One, you can give that one a try for free. And funny enough, the backwards compatibility version of Burnout Paradise is available as well if you already have the disc from the 360 version. Um, and last but not least is Nintendo's big game for uh, this part of the year is Kirby Star Allies. It came out on the 16th. As I mentioned earlier in the BitCast, it's not being reviewed that well. It's only being reviewed at a 75 strong. Um, if you love Kirby, give it a try. If you are looking for something new that you're going to fall in love with on the Switch, this may not be the game for you. So um, let's kind of talk about what we're currently playing, Ains. Um, I know after you put Kirby down because you couldn't uh, just you know drop it. <laughs> what else are you playing right now? Yeah, the the online play on Kirby was just I couldn't overcome the challenge, um, so I just I had to put it down. Um, Kingdom Come Deliverance is the game that I have been playing pretty much non-stop over the past two weeks or so since we last talked um the more i've played it the more i've really kind of uh enjoyed it uh, i know when we first talked i'd only put a you know handful of hours couple hours into it and i said it was a little janky but i was intrigued um it is still a little janky but maybe not as much as uh you know as i would have let on early on um it <laughs> 
I'm trying to think of the best words to say this. It's a big open world medieval RPG um, based in realism with, uh, you know, real history. And uh, because of that, uh, it coming from a small team, if you can imagine a game like Skyrim and that gameplay style, but developed by a smaller team, you know, obviously, if you've played a lot of games, you would kind of know what to expect there. But they've been really good. Warhorse Studios has already put out three different patches. They have fixed a lot of the quest bugs and little things that have come up. Um, to be honest, I haven't really experienced any bugs, any kind of game breaking or quest breaking bugs. And there's just some little funny things that happen, uh, you know, throughout the world on occasion. But the game itself, I am really, really enjoying. I put up some impressions just yesterday, actually. Um, I've got about 20 or so hours into it now, and uh, the story is good. Some of the quest writing is really, really funny. It reminds me a lot, which is a, a really big compliment of The Witcher 3 in some of the quest writing. Um, there was one quest where you had to help a, um, uh, a priest or a preacher, I forget, and um, you get into all this debauchery and drinking and sex, and it, it was just freaking comical. Um, I was sitting here playing by myself laughing, but um, it's neat. There's a lot of freedom to it. You do what you want in the world and uh, you kind of live with the consequences Consequences in the world will adjust around you. So it's it's really well done. I, I like it a lot. But um, if you're interested in that, obviously there's reviews out there. I put up my impressions, which are a little longer than normal impressions. So please check those out. And then um, other than that, multiplayer games, you know, just mostly pub still. Um, the Xbox version of pub has 5 million players. It's still going very, very strong, and we've been playing a ton of it. In fact, I know you'll touch on it because it's kind of surprising to see you playing a, a multiplayer game so steadily. Um, but uh, loving that. And then lastly, uh, still playing Smite again, as always. Um, the Season 5 just came out for Smite, which brought a new god, Achilles. Uh, along with, you know, a whole bunch of item changes and everything. If you follow Smite or follow MOBAs, you kind of know what that means. And then it's also the fourth birthday of Smite, um, which means they're doing a celebration. Gems are cheaper. There's all kinds of chests and skins and everything else. So if you're, uh, you know, if you were a fan of Smite or you played a lot and haven't played it recently, now's a good time to jump back in. What about you? Yeah, so I'm all over the place, as you just joked about me in multiplayer games. So I'm more of a single-player um, gamer, I guess you could say it. And um, I finally got into my backlog, and I started playing Final Fantasy XV. Um, so on the joke of Final Fantasy VII killed Final Fantasy <laughs> series, um, I actually enjoy Final Fantasy Final ugh, Final <laughs> Fantasy XV quite a bit. Um, if you are into any of the, I guess, anime-type jokes and uh, pop culture that come along with it, this one's fantastic for it. Um, it's very, very different from any of the Final Fantasies that have come out recently, and um, the development cycle was nuts on that one as well. And uh, I'm really enjoying what it is so far. If you had a chance to watch the movie that came out before the game release, which is called Kingsglaive, um, I'd highly recommend watching that before starting the game because it puts the whole universe and the story in context as to what's going on. So it's it's really good so far. Um, I have tried to go back and finish Near Automata. I don't know what it is about that game, but um, I keep getting to the same 10 to 15 hour uh, point in that game and just losing interest over and over and over. And uh, it's really strange because it kind of has everything that I love in those types of games. I, I fell in love with Bayonetta series quite a bit. I've played them multiple times, each one of them. And I've been told that if you love Bayonetta, you'll love Nier Automata. And I've talked about Nier Automata being a very unique game, but I don't really love the game. And despite seeing a lot of um, critics online and stuff like that saying it's their favorite game from 2017, I just have a hard time getting through it. So I don't know if I'll ever finish the game, but it's, it's cool to see and play through. Um, as you mentioned, PUBG, um, loving it, uh, loving all the uh, fixes and patches that come through because it just makes the game a lot more um, easy to play and easy to understand why you got killed sometimes. I mean, there's still some wacky moments that happen in that game that happen in that game that make zero sense, but it's fun because literally every game is a different experience that you play with one map. Um, so enjoying that. And uh, lastly, I did start Dirt 4. I bought that game, gosh, near launch, which was a long time ago, and I'm finally getting to it. Um, I planned it on the on the X, so it does have some nice enhancements, and I love it so far. Hopefully, I can stick to it. And then on the vein of Codemasters, I did go back and play a couple races for F1 2017 due to the first F1 race just happening this weekend in Australia. So I had to kind of get in the mood, and, and it's awesome as usual. And then, funny enough, I hadn't played any of the big races on the X. I initially reviewed the game for our site back on the PS4 Pro when it released uh, due to the enhancements in there. So... Kind of cool to see it all uh, put together, and I'm um, looking forward to our season where we can play with one team. And it's going to be uh, great. So um, I'm right. actually installing it as we speak, so uh -huh. it should be soon. 
<laughs> All right, folks. So that is our uh, currently playing for this week and new releases. Um, as we mentioned, this time of the year is just kind of a weird time for games because most of most of the games don't really come out at this time in, the, in Q1. So that kind of segues us into kind of our main topic for this week. Um, and it's kind of what are our thoughts about 2018 so far with Q1 kind of ending here on March 31st, uh, this coming week, depending on when you're listening to us. Um, kind of want to t- uh, touch on what 2018 has kind of looked like so far. So, you know, games that we've talked about that we didn't play in 2017, have we played them in 2018? What games have we loved that have released so far? What games are we kind of seeing as our front runner for a game of the year? Things like that. So. We're going to kind of touch on that for the next few minutes and kind of let you know what we think about Q1 of 2018. So I'll start with you, Ains. Is there anything that um, you had backlogged from 2017 that maybe was one of those AAA games or even nominated for Game of the Years that you've gotten to from uh, 2018 so far? No, not not in terms of AAA or Game of the Year. Um, I did go back. The game I probably played most from last year that I didn't touch until this year was The Surge. Uh, and I think I mentioned that a couple of podcasts ago. So I put a good 25 or so hours, I think, 30 hours into it. I'm about three quarters of the way through it. Um, and I, I just stopped playing it. Uh, I was kind of into it for a little bit. And um, uh, I'm I'm really kind of powered up. And I'm, right, I'm relatively near the end, I think. But... Uh, I just Kingdom Come Deliverance came out the same time. We started playing a lot of pub, and I, I just haven't gotten back to it since then. But uh, I did enjoy it. I would say it's a, a good game, not a great game. It has some neat concepts, and uh, I thought it was neat to go back to. I don't, you know me, I play so much multiplayer that I don't often go back to a single player game, you know, that I hadn't touched. I also installed um, Dishonor 2. We've talked about that one. I think that was late 2016, right? <laughs> Um, it got enhanced for, you know, the Xbox one X I haven't installed. I haven't pinned up on my home screen and I, I just, uh, I just haven't gotten to it and I really want to, but I, I don't know when I'm going to, um, I think that's, uh, you know, supposed to be a great game and, uh, I just, I want to play it, but I haven't gotten to. And then lastly, I put, um, I put about 40 hours into persona five last year. Um, really enjoyed it. You know, like I've said before, I'm not an anime fan, but that game was just, uh, fantastic. And, um, I was watching something with Patricia, or excuse me, my wife, on um, on <laughs> talking to you like we're just talking. Um, I was watching something with my wife the other day, and I, I happened to hear some Japanese music in it, and it just instantly reminded me of Persona 5 and walking around the town, and I was like, man, I need to go back and play that some more. So, um, yeah, I think those are probably the games from 2017 and late 2016 that uh, you know I really want to get into or, or have been getting back into. Yeah, so um, kind of cool about those games. Funny enough, Dishonored 2, I've, I've got about five hours in that game, and I just lost interest in that game. So another game that has huge critical praise, but now I know why people just didn't love it that much. I'm kind of understanding it. Maybe I'll force myself to push through. Uh, we, we have joked about um, putting together kind of like a video on games that just start out horribly for the first five, six hours, and then just get amazing um, throughout the game, which is kind of the next game that I did play this year that was 2017, and that's Assassin's Creed Origins. I mean, it's got a very slow start, um, but then when you actually start playing the game, it it turns out to be amazing. So that is one of my favorite games that I wish I had played in 2017. And then um, lastly is Hellblade. Um, I had put Hellblade on my back burner, didn't care too much about it until I started it, and it's probably the game that I had that I was unable to put down once I started. Even multiplayer games and everything, I didn't play anything until I finished Hellblade. Thankfully, it's only 10 to 12 hours long, so I was able to get through it. And um, you know, I will kind of mention some things about Hellblade later on too. But uh, yeah, that, that's kind of one of the amazing things about the games that have come out from 2017 for me in 2018. So um, I'm trying to think of anything. I feel like there's another game that was really big in 2017 that I haven't got to. I mean, I did try The Surge. Um, some of those games are just too hard for me. I got to the third boss, and I can't beat the third boss. I even follow the guides on how to beat them, and I just I can't do it. And so when I get too frustrated, I just shell the game. Thankfully, I think I paid 15 bucks for it. But it's really cool. If you like Soul Styles games, um, it's a must-play. I'm not sure if you'll fall in love with it, but a lot of people do love it. So it's kind of it for that one. Um, so let's talk about where we are in 2018 as we've kind of talked already um 2018 at this point does not have a lot of big releases out they start coming out in q2 or at the end of q1 and funny enough q1 um, ends on the 31st and we have far cry 5 coming out next week so that might be taking over what we talk about next but what has been your 
favorite release from the uh, 2018 calendar so far? Ains? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I thought it was going to be Shadow of the Colossus um, because, uh, you know, I've heard so many good things about it. It was reviewed amazingly well. And uh, thankfully, because of you, I was able to get the special edition that uh, Amazon lost. Um, but I, I started it. I put, God, maybe two hours into it. Uh, not not very far at all. And I just it, it didn't pull me in at all. So I need to force myself to go back and and put some time into it because I know, you know, I want to try and understand the praise that the game's received over the past decade. It's been out of it's the third release of the game. So um, but it is gorgeous. And uh, I thought uh, the scope and cinematics kind of above it at the start were very neat. So I'll see if I go back to that. But my favorite release for 2018 um, has to be Kingdom Come Deliverance. Uh, like I was just saying, I, I've now got a lot of time into it. I'm going to be spending a lot more time in it, I'm sure. And I'm um, just enjoying the hell out of it. It, it provides a sense of um, uh, escapism that many games don't. Uh, I really feel like when I'm playing that game, like I'm kind of there. And it does a good job of making you feel like you've taken the role of Henry, um, who's the main uh, protagonist in the game. Um, you know, and just uh, just doing what you want in that world, which I love. So I, th I would say that's my favorite release. Um, uh, it's kind of surprising to me because I don't think you're gonna they mention this as one of your favorites either. But you know, probably the biggest release of 2018 is Monster Hunter World, and uh, it's sold already like eight million copies. I know a lot of people I talk to within the industry are playing it and loving it, and have been since it released nearly two months ago now. Um, but neither of us really kind of get into it, so it's kind of interesting that what has been probably the biggest release of 2018 so far, um, neither of us really care for too much. Yeah, I have a feeling industry-wide, um, I think that is the game of the year uh, front runner so far. I really don't think anything else touches it. Um, for 2018, it's been really slow for me as well. I, I Thankfully, with this slow uh, release calendar going on right now, I've been able to catch on and catch up with a lot of the games that I didn't play in 2017. But um, a game that I was really excited to try was the Secret of Mana game that was a remaster slash remake, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I literally played it for an hour, and then I was like, what the heck is this? This is no remaster. This is not what it was supposed to be. And I literally stopped playing it and uninstalled. So kind of like one of those things, like, I'm straight uninstalling this game. I actually did because um, I don't have as much room on my PS4 Pro than I need to. Um, but another game that um, I love so far this year is Dragon Ball Z Fighters. Or no, Dragon Ball Fighters. It's not Dragon Ball Z Fighters. Um, but once again, and one of the things that I think has happened across you know, the entire online um, community is that a lot of people loved it for about two weeks. And then the people that were playing it fell off. They moved on to something else. So I'm not really sure what that means um, from the game as far as legs go and how far it's going to go. I mean, they have new characters coming out, you know, really soon. They've already announced what's going to be kind of coming on the calendar. And I hope it reels more people in. But I don't know if that game, I don't know. I mean, Mortal Kombat and Injustice 2, I, I played and played. I still play Injustice 2 every once in a while to see their DLC. But I'm already kind of over Dragon Ball Z. Oh, God, I said it again. Dragon Ball Fighters uh, with the Z at the end. Um, and to your point, I mean, Shadow Colossus, I just haven't touched yet. I installed it. I had some friends over. We played it for about an hour that we used to love. But... Did you never play the original Shadow Colossus Ains oh. on the PS2? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have that as their favorite game of all time. So um, I loved it a lot. I don't know if it's my favorite game of all time or even if it breaks the top 10, but it's fantastic. I hope to come back to it. And it is really pretty. That's all I can give it. But um, kind of unfortunate that there's not a lot of uh, massive releases. I guess this is the one part of the year where we're not kind of overloaded with uh, game releases, which is good. Yeah, I think... Uh... You know, Monster Hunter World, like we said, probably by far the biggest release so far this year. But I think the first big release of the year beyond that is uh, is definitely Far Cry 5, right, on on Tuesday here. Uh, in just a couple days, which I am very, very excited for. Um, the whole, not only the story and the gameplay, it supposedly looks absolutely incredible on the X and I'm sure high NPCs. Um, the arcade mode in it sounds really, really interesting and intriguing about uh, how, you know, players will get to create their own kind of spaces and other players can play those. And it, it brings in assets from multiple games, including like Black Flag and uh, Far Cry Primal. And you can throw things together in this world. Um, and then the DLC, the season pass for it, even though, you know, we've talked before about not being big fans of season passes. Um, it looks really, really interesting in what they're doing with it because they've got like a Mars one, they've got a zombie one, and they've got a Vietnam one. So it, it looks to be kind of along the the just uh, Ubisoft going out, 
you know, into the craziness rather than continuing Far Cry 5 story, which I'm assuming is self-contained. Um, this looks to just expand in fun ways, which I think is uh, is neat. So I hope it's worth it. I'm going to go ahead and pick up the gold version of that. So I think for AAA, big budget, big publisher releases, Far Cry 5 will be the first big one for me in 2018. Yeah, and funny enough, the Far Cry, what is it, the gold edition you said? Um, yep. It's not it's not outlandishly expensive. And even if you become to one of the reward programs, whether it be Amazon, GameStop, or Best Buy, you can get it for a decent price. So it's kind of one of the good things about their pricing model, which... If you're going to get into the game, it makes almost the most sense to buy the gold edition um, if you're buying that. But that kind of takes us to our, our new things. Um, so is there anything that you're – what are the most anticipated things that are coming up um, at the end of Q1 for you? Because, I mean, Q1 has been kind of slow for us, but what, what are you looking forward to in Q2 maybe? Yeah, kind of jumped the gun with Far Cry 5 there. But, yeah, I think uh, Far Cry 5 and then obviously after that for me is God of War, uh, as you can see behind me. That is, um, that's only three weeks, you know, after that, after Far Cry 5. So um, I think God of War is going to be excellent. And I'm excited in the sense that, you know, I spend so much time on multiplayer games like Pub and, and others that um, when a game like God of War comes out, as long as I like it and it pulls me in, it's nice to be able to play a contained experience like 20 hours. I'll play it. I'll enjoy it. I'll remember it. But then I can put it down. I don't feel that kind of nagging sense in the back of my head to have to go and play it. It's it's a done a done deal. Um, so I think that'll be neat, too, whereas Far Cry 5, I'll probably put, you know, tens and tens of hours into because it's open world and it's also got those interconnected experiences as well. Yeah, my favorite two things from Q1 are probably Metal Gear Survive. Um, no, 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 I'm just kidding. No one ever. Uh, but I am looking forward to Nintendo Labo. Stop it. No, still nothing? All right, well, uh, no, Far Cry 5 is probably what I'm looking forward to the most, and, and God of War as well. Um, I mean, we still don't know um, how good or bad any of the newer games are going to come out, like Spider-Man or um, what's the... Uh, the game from from on Sony or Qua, Beyond Two Souls, Detroit, uh, Detroit, yeah, Detroit become uh, become human. Obviously, being kind of drug in the in the dirt in the press these days, I have no idea if that's going to be any good. Um, State you know, of just, Decay Two comes. Uh, State of Decay Two and Detroit come the same week, actually in May. Yeah, so that's the only other big stuff coming. So, um, yeah, to, to your point and to uh, kind of what we we're talking about before, it kind of gives us a chance to catch up with backlog or just play a lot of multiplayer. Um, I'm personally going to be doing a lot of backlog, but Q1 has been extremely slow this year. Um, and it's been kind of um, all over the place, even for the Nintendo fans. If you've played a lot of the um, remasters and ports already, there really has been nothing new uh, to play on the Switch, which is kind of explaining why some of the console sales might be low in our opinion. But um, yeah, so um, overall thoughts on Q1, Ains? Uh, slow? Love it? Yeah, I mean... I think last year's Q1 was better, right? 2017 was almost a record year, and we got uh, Persona 5, we got Resident Evil 7. Um, I think, I don't know if Hellblade was Q1. I can't remember. There were several big games in the first quarter of 2017, which I don't think 2018 has matched, especially not for me personally. But I think if Far Cry 5 is really, really good, um, and then Kingdom Come Deliverance, I'm loving, like I said, and, uh, you know, it's just after Q1, but if God of War is as good as we're hoping, then, it, you know, it's still been a decent early year. Yeah, and funny enough, the game I was talking about a second ago, Near Automata, released last Q1. Um, yeah, and that another people, one. It took everybody by storm. People loved it. Um, so last question for you about Q1. Has there any been anything that you bought that released that has been straight to backlog, still sitting in that crispy wrapper? Um, <laughs> um, Shadow of the Colossus is probably the closest uh, in the sense that I, I opened it and because I wanted to look through the special edition. I've only played it, like I said, maybe an hour or two. Um, so it's technically open, but not really. Um, you know, I don't know if I've bought any games that I've just immediately put away. We were we were talking about backlog, and the the one game I forgot to mention that is still sealed that I wanted to play from last year was uh, Final Fantasy XII because we were joking about the Final Fantasies, but Final Fantasy XII was um, remastered, and you know, it's supposed to be more of that classic Final Fantasy style, similar more to like nine and the early ones, which were my favorites. Uh, so I did want to go back and play that. Speaking of the backlog, but. No, I don't think I've, um, other than that, I don't think I've bought any games that I haven't touched at all. Yeah. Um, funny enough, I bought a lot of 2017 games um, that have gone on sale right now, and they're still in their wrapper. But yeah, Secret of Mana, extremely let down with that game. 
uh, Dragon Ball Z Fighters, you know, played it a bunch, but then didn't put it down. I did, funny enough, catch up with Resident Evil Revelation series. I finished one and two uh, recently. And funny enough, with Game Pass, I started Resident Evil 6. And it's fun for what it is, but it's not an amazing game by any means whatsoever. If you can find a buddy to play that co-op wise, uh, I definitely suggest it because it's kind of fun from a Resident Evil standpoint after playing some of the other Resident Evil titles. So, well, cool. Um, that is our kind of main topic for today, folks. Just wanted to touch on Q1. As I mentioned, it's it's ending here on March 31st. We'll start Q2 where some of the uh, bigger games are going to be coming out. Um, and we'll be able to kind of talk more about those as they come. Far Cry 5 coming out this week. We're pretty excited about it, and uh, we'll be putting our hands on it this week. Might even be our stream streaming game this week, so um, catch us on stream for that. But um, now let's take a look at our um, one of our favorite uh, sections of our vidcast is collectibles. So, Ains, why don't we start out with you? Anything you've picked up recently in the last month, two weeks, anything? No, I just wanted to quickly mention, I don't have anything big to show, but I did want to mention, we were joking about Final Fantasies, um, and they've been around, believe it or not, Final Fantasy has been around for 30 years now. Um, started on the NES, and Edge Magazine out of the UK does uh, a lot of special things with their covers, and I'm a big, for whatever reason, I'm a big collector of like special video game magazine covers. Um, and so I have this behind me which is a uh, for the 30th anniversary of Final Fantasy, um, Edge did a cover for every single Final Fantasy game, 1 through 15. And so, um, you know, depending on where you were and what Final Fantasy is your favorite, you may be able to hunt one of these down. But what I was able to actually get here is the cover from the artwork, the classic Japanese uh, artwork for Final Fantasy 1. So this is the Edge 30th anniversary Final Fantasy 1 cover. Um, and I just find it to be really, really neat. So if you're a big fan of the franchise, you can still get these. It was the February issue of Edge, but if you go on Edge online, you can actually order back uh, back copy issues. So if like if you are a big Final Fantasy VII fan, they have one, you know, with Cloud and some of the other artwork on the front. Uh, Nine and you know, fourteen's obviously the MMO, so they have all those. But I think they're really neat. So if you like those kind of special covers with special artwork for the games you love, that's something to definitely check out. But um. Other than that, uh, not too much, really. You can see a couple Cuphead pops behind me here. So if you're someone who likes the little pop figures, uh, the whole Cuphead series is out now. And they've also announced a uh, the next Halo series. So Halo pops are worth a ton of money. They came out several years ago, and they're hard to find. Some go for over $100 each. And so they've announced a new line with uh, Chief. There's an Arbiter. There's a Sergeant Johnson. Um, so if, you know, if you're a big Halo fan, obviously you want to get your orders in for those. And there's a few exclusive ones as always. So that's about it for me. What do you got? Cool. So, um, I've been kind of on the hunt for some hard to find items. Um, got the Sea of Thieves Microsoft controller. So I never knew that this was going to turn into a collectible. I thought it would just be another controller that comes out, but this does a lot of really cool things. It lights up in certain things. I'm not even sure if I'm going to take it out of the box just because it's hard to find, but um, it was kind of one of the more expensive controllers that um, came out. It was, uh, I think, $79.99. Your average controller from the Xbox One goes for $59.99. You can find it on sale all day for 50 bucks or something. But these are going about $150 already, and you can't find them anywhere. Uh, I think, Ains, both you and I checked the Microsoft stores. We checked our local retailers. Um, really hard to find. Thankfully, I found a guy on Craigslist selling it for 100 I was able to get him down to 90 um, and so he only made a five dollar profit on me which is nice but uh, i plan to keep it um so really excited i got one um i believe and correct me if i'm wrong Ains, the skull turns on different colors and the buttons light up different things um so it, that's cool it, it uh it's um uh, glow in the dark yes thank you <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, they, they don't light up at all actually uh, <laughs> they, you gotta you gotta hold it up to the light <laughs> um, and then they light up. But it does come with some DLC, which is kind of cool. The Master Chief controller and I think Lock, if you bought it by itself and not with the console, also came um, with some DLC in the actual game that you can play. So kind of cool to get that. And lastly, um, I did pick up the uh, Collector's Edition to Nino Kuni 2, um, which is massive. And I'm not sure how well I'm going to be able to get this to show on the screen here. But uh, you can kind of see all the uh, DLC items that it comes with. <laughs> Um, there is a ton of stuff that is in this box. I have yet to open it because I'm not sure if I'm going to keep it. Um, when it comes to Nino Kuni 1, it was one of my favorite RPGs of all time. Um, oh, one other thing is that there's only 25,000 of these, and let me uh, show you why. It's got a little number on the front where you can see what, what number I got. So I got uh, 
8,451 of the 25,000. And uh, another kind of unfortunate thing here is we had pre-ordered these when they initially announced them and then a whole second stock of pre-orders came through. So it's not as collectible as it was before, but uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to keep it yet. Um, it is kind of a pricey collector's edition. I mean, it is $200. So $199.99. If you're part of the reward program with whatever the case is, you can get it cheaper, but uh, to spend $200 on a collector's edition that I may or may not play and is not very limited. Um, I'm not sure if I'll keep it, but um, it's kind of cool to get. It's a big box, like I mentioned, and um, that's it for me in collectibles. This week. <laughs> I was laughing because when you held the box up, it rubbed on the mic, so you, you gave everyone a nice little squeak as you went across there. Yeah, it's a little sound effect holding up the box. <laughs> there you go. But uh, yeah, kind of unfortunate. Um, anyways, let's, uh, let's jump over to our second favorite uh, section, which is season reflections. We usually go through... Uh, a game that is from the past that is something that we liked or loved or something. And then we briefly talk about it, give you some details about it. So Ains, why don't you kick us off? Yeah. So I mentioned earlier that I just got out of the Tomb Raider movie and one of the previews before the Tomb Ra Raider movie was the preview for Rampage, which they are turning into a movie and looks, uh, in my opinion, absolutely ridiculous. Um, so I, I don't know what's going on there, but it made me think of the game. And so I pulled out my Sega Master System version of Rampage. The game was on, you know, multiple systems and has been rebooted and there's multiple versions. There's a big one on GameCube. Um, but really neat. This was a fantastic game in the arcade. I loved when it came out for the Master System. Me and my friends would play this all the time. As you can see here in the corner, if you can see that, it actually has two megabit power. So it was an extremely powerful game. I don't know if you can handle it. Um, but this came out in 19. <laughs> this came out in 1986, which goes to show you how long ago. So this was uh, it's pretty neat. You know, you get the three characters, you get your two players, and it's uh, 50 cities to smash and crush, and uh, it's just a lot of fun. So, um, like I said, there's been many, many versions of Rampage. Uh, I know the GameCube one is remember remembered fondly. Excuse me. Um, but fun game. If you've never played these growing up, you should check them out just for a laugh. But uh, I don't know what they're doing with that new movie. It looks uh, looks kind of ridiculous. Hey, but it's got The Rock in it, or I'm supposed to say Dwayne Johnson in it, and it's just uh, going to save the whole, the whole movie, as people think he always does. But <laughs> I don't know. The, the trailer just kind of cracks me up as to what it is and what it turns out to. I, I don't know. There were some people that I saw a screener at, um, I think, South by Southwest here in Austin, and they said it was actually kind of fun, but I don't know. There's a flying be. dog. There's a flying yeah, dog yeah. in it. There's yeah. They turn the so apparently the ape is like a normal ape who's a friend with Dwayne Johnson, and he gets some chemical thing which makes him bigger, and then he has to fight other monsters. So it's it's a completely different story, you know, than the uh, than the actual game. So we'll see. I don't know. Dwayne Johnson's awesome, but I don't know if he can save this one. Yeah, he got so spoiled by Pacific Rim that I've seen those big monsters. So moving on before he can comment, um, my season reflection. <laughs> is uh, Nino Kuni 1. <laughs> so uh, the reason I'm mentioning this one is because I got the collector's edition for the next one. But uh, when I was talking about the collector's edition, I did mention that part one of this game was one of my favorite games when it comes to RPGs. And um, so this came out in January of 2013. Um, and it was a kind of a relationship between uh, Level 5, which is the developer, and Studio Ghibli. So if you're into any of Miyazaki anime movies, which is, once again, Ains' favorite topic, anime, um, they did get the artists and all the artists uh, from Studio Ghibli to make all the art in the game. And the game is pretty fantastic. The story's great. The characters are great. You really kind of uh, learn the fighting style and the, and the system that's very different from other turn-based games, and it does it really, really well. Um, one of the unfortunate things is that Nino Kuni 2 is not related to Nino Kuni 1 in any way whatsoever. Um, it's still kind of uh, being done by Bandai uh, Namco and Level 5, but Studio Ghibli is not really involved with the development of the game whatsoever. There was a few artists that came through for part two, but the overall studio is not part of the game. And so they've changed the story. They're not related. Um, another fun fact about Nino Kuni 1 is that there was a game that released um, on the Nintendo DS in 2010 that was actually called Nino Kuni, and it had a different title. I believe it was... Uh, Dominion of Dark Something. Um, and funny enough, Nino Kuni 2, Wrath, or sorry, Nino Kuni 1, Wrath of the Witch is pretty much an enhanced version of that Nintendo DS game. So it's not an original game from that standpoint, but if you never played the Nintendo DS version, this is going to be completely original to you and, and brand new. But um, I did love it again. It is still playable if you're wondering if it's still playable. Um, it's unfortunately only on the PS3, it was a PS3 exclusive. 
but I loved it. Um, and that's really it about Nino Kuni one. Um, hopefully people that did love one love two in some form. I don't know if I'll be one of those guys, but it's one of those uh, review scores that is really divisive between the industry. Some people love it. Some people fell asleep playing it literally. So I don't know. That's, that's kind of where we're at. <laughs> um, anyways, so let's go ahead and close out our bitcast for this week, folks. So, uh, first of all, thanks for listening in. If there's anything that we can do better or you kind of, we lost you at some point, uh, let us know. Um, we can uh, see if we can improve on these and get some more feedback from you guys. We have a few new uh, stuff on our site. So if, uh, as Ains was talking about his kingdom, um, uh, come deliverance game, uh, impressions are up. So you can take a look at those. Ains, you want to mention anything about that? No, not in particular. Just uh, like I said, loving the game. Impressions are up. I might do a full review in the future, but for now, you can check those out. I'd appreciate it. I also wanted to give a real quick shout out and a thank you to everyone who donated to my Extra Life charity. I uh, did the PUBG event about a month ago and uh, passed the $500 raise mark, which was fantastic. And I just this week got my uh, kind of congratulatory message from Extra Life along with my winner winner chicken dinner pin. Um, you can see there, so pretty excited about that and just wanted to thank anyone who donated. I am actually going to be streaming for Extra Life uh, the remainder of the year now as, a, as kind of a full-time member, so I'll be posting when I'm going to be doing that and what games I'm going to be doing over the rest of the year, so keep you updated on that. Good deal. Well, uh, thanks for listening, guys. If you uh, want to catch us on Twitter, we do have a Season Gaming Twitter. Um, we also have individuals. I, I'm Treb underscore SG and Ains is at Porsche Power. Make sure to follow us on there if you haven't already. If you're looking for a more kind of mature conversation, we also have a Facebook group. You can find us as Season Gaming and then request access. We usually approve everybody unless you're crazy. Um, and we try to <laughs> we try to keep it as mature as possible. So if you're coming in there to start a kind of a fanboy war, or just argue with people, then we'll pretty much kick you out but uh, a lot of stuff on there we share anything from sales games we're playing and we run a lot of fun polls on there to kind of get a little vibe from our community on there so join on there if you can but other than that um thanks for listening folks <laughs>